Welcome to this week's Off The Court. We're back down under and I'm very excited to welcome ex-Australian Diamond coach Lisa Alexander. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Tamsin. It's a joy to be with you and I just enjoy our chat so much. Well, you know what I said? I said I'm going to be very excited about this one. I know it's going to easily fill our time slot because um, over the years we've uh, we've chatted lots about netball and I think uh, we love putting the netball worlds to rights and having great conversations, not not just about how the netball's run and set up, but also about the coaching. And I've massively admired you uh, for a very long time. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're back in Australia. We've done a few few interviews over there at the moment. Uh, what are you up to? I'm actually doing, I call myself a coach whisperer. Um, it's a little bit like the horse whisperers because understanding the whole, what I call biopsychosocial aspect of coaching, and I'll quote Dan Abrahams here, who's a, who's a POM, who I do like. I like his work in psychology. And it's around that. It's around um, talking with coaches about the fact that it's not all the X's and O's and the technical work on the court, although that's fascinating, don't get me wrong, and it's still <laughs> very important. Um, it's so much about the understanding of the biology, the understanding of the social nature of netball, and, of course, culture. You know, that's the big one that can make or break a coach, to be fair. Um, that's it in a nutshell, and it's sometimes no matter how strong your culture is, you can still lose by one goal in a gold medal final. And what it does is it helps you cope with that as well and move on and improve. So uh, you can't control what your opposition's doing, but you can control what your club or your country are, are doing. Um, and that's what I try and seek to um, educate coaches about. I can educate coaches not just in netball, but in most of the invasion sports like football, uh, your football, your uh, our Australian rules football. Um, I'm fascinated with rug rugby league at the moment. I'm just watching it like a hawk at the moment. I'm in fact preferring it to Australian rules football, which is a big thing to say for a Victorian girl from Melbourne. <laughs> yep. Um, but it's just better at the moment, and it's fascinating watching it. Um, so, yeah, that's what turns me on at the moment, Tamsin. And and also living in the country, we get out and about and I chop some firewood and although <laughs> my husband probably doesn't think I do enough. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I'm, I'm sure you're pulling your weight, Lisa. I'm sure you are. I want to pick up on that because it's so funny, isn't it? Because you, you go through coaching and it's it's always on your technical, tactical, how much you win and and you do all your coaching courses and you get your badges and no one really stops to go, right, how do you build a good culture and how do you play and manage and how do you work? And and I think that's so important. And there's, there's a huge role in this whole piece missing. Where do you even start with that? Because I always talk about it, it's long term and it's not just something that's written down on a piece of paper. Well, that's the thing. You can't give a formula for it. You have to be immersed in it. I was very fortunate to be immersed in a whole year of learning with Joyce Brown back in 1994. Yes, that was... 30 years ago and Don't. I was so lucky to go away with her to New Zealand with the team just hanging around in fact Jenny Borlase who I just worked with this week as our head coach of the South Australian under 19 team which I mentored as well as the 17s um, I was actually throwing balls at her because Joyce wanted me to do that so I was smashing really hard balls at her to get her to catch because Joyce felt that her hands were a little bit, you know, just need a bit of work. At the same time, of course, me, I'm a teacher by profession. I would be talking with Jen and, you know, how are you feeling? Um, you know, what's going on with you? And that just came quite naturally to me, but it doesn't, it doesn't always come naturally to everybody. And I think what we need to say is that coaches can be introverts as well as extroverts. And so you've got to figure out your way of communicating that's authentic to you. Um, and that's just the way I did it. I, I just got to know, I always got to know the athlete, uh, the person behind the athlete. Joyce Brown schooled me in that as well. 
um, as the master coach, really, um, for Australia. Three world titles she won. It's pretty awesome wow. as a coach. Yeah, it's incredible. And I, th- I think picking up on that piece of of sort of that communication and, and how you, because it's not just about you as a coach, you talk about whether you can be an introvert, an extrovert, whatever, but it's also the players. You never get a group of players that all operate, operate the same. They want feedback differently. They they buzz differently. <laughs> yeah, they, they come in in, in different um in different ways all the time to the session so it's constantly evolving and I quite like what you picked up on about how performance crosses over and, and just because you've excelled in one sport it, there's actually it's quite an open door to slide across into other sports because it's not just about the game it's about the whole piece do you think we're doing that well enough at the moment do you think female coaches in particular are being given that opportunity to go right you've been successful in this environment it can cross over into other sports uh no that's the short answer. I think <laughs> I think men's uh, are many men in coaching don't even think about it. And for me, what they're missing out on, it's like when I when I challenge our politicians over here. In the past, we've had not enough women uh, seeking to represent their local areas in politics, and that doesn't reflect our society, which is. It's not good. It's not good for our society. And it's the same in coaching and high performance. It's better to have a balance because you get Mm. such different input from women coaches. Uh, We are more intuitive. We are, in many respects, more empathetic. So we can actually round out a coaching team. I don't know why more of the professional men's sports do not have women coaches on their teams regardless of which sport they coach if you're a really good coach you're a really good coach it doesn't matter about the x and o's because at the end of the day that sport it's about people if you can motivate if you can teach if you can cajole if you can reward it's it's all about the psychology at the end of the day in my opinion no, look, I agree, and I actually like the fact that that female sports coaching could be forefront and centre on sort of pushing that agenda yeah. as well. That crosses over into so much other stuff. I'm I'm actually intrigued. Do you have a problem recruiting sort of female netball coaches over there at all levels? Because I know it's something that we are still struggling with. Whether that's a time management piece, whether that's a confidence piece, whether we're not. Um, whether the, the job opportunities, because there are a lot of volunteer roles, you know, is, is that is that an issue there? Yes, because it, it is. it's definitely it, a problem over here. In a short answer again, yes. It is, um, part of it is socio-cultural, of course. It's the fact that many women are the primary caregivers in their houses, do the most housework. That's what it shows on our Australian demographics that the Australian Bureau of Statistics hold. And so if you haven't got the time, you can't do the volunteer work out in the community. I certainly see that here in a, my own little town here in Avoca in Victoria. Um, you know, I think, you know, the women are working hard and they're doing some of the stuff around the club that actually should be shared roles with men and the boys in the club. Um, I'll give you an example on the ca- canteen. There's a roster and it's all women doing it from the netball, and the boys are not doing it. That's not good role modelling. That's not an inclusive um, club that actually shows that everyone is responsible for all of those jobs. So that's where it starts. And we are also our worst enemies because I think we just take on too much and put too much on few shoulders, and then it becomes a huge burden Um, And we don't support well enough sometimes. I mean, in general, netball is is an amazing sport for support. I mean, when I was an 18-year-old who'd just had a baby, the women that put their arms around me and welcomed me back into the sport, they were the ones that made a big difference in my life. So I always remember that. Yeah, it can it can have absolute huge impact, can't it? And I think we talk about this netball family, but like you say, there's there's a shift between sort of that in ter- terms of encompassing it, each other, but also how much load you take on. I know something we still struggle here in the Super League is that you're doing dual roles. 
you know, we ha- we interviewed Tracy Nev last week and um, I asked her a question about how they were getting Mavericks fans in. And she went, I don't know, T, I'm just coaching. Whereas <laughs> you know, as I know, if you're doing that job in England, you're getting well, fans, she, you're down at camp with Pathway. You're- she was very lucky because when I was, one of the briefs when I first took over the Diamonds was that I had to grow the brand of the Diamonds as well. So wow. I had to put myself out there front and centre. And I think a lot of people thought I did it because I had, you know, had a big head. But really, I was trying to sell the sport. We needed bums yeah. on seats. We needed packed houses. We needed money to run our high performance program, which we're still struggling with today. And, you know, it's 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 a conundrum. And I did have to spend quite a bit of time on that. I really enjoyed it. And it's actually helped me with my part-time gig as a a news column, columnist now and also doing interviews like you do um to you know just i'm i'm really keen to highlight our super netball coaches because they're just world class and people should know about them like tracy like the stories that i've got about tracy are really interesting <laughs> and you know us yeah. traveling in a car together from manchester to surrey when i was taking one of her um you know teacher professional development sessions myself and julie fitzgerald after we'd been beaten by you lot in three tests it wasn't much fun but it just made the it made the end of the trip a little (laughs) bit better (laughs) well i think i think that's one of the the beautiful pieces about about sport is that on the court you have so many uh competitive competitors and you go against each other but we've got so many friendships off the court and we we do a lot of dual sharing I want to pick up back into elite then because Mm. Super League at the moment Jill McIntosh has come over and she's sitting with Cardiff Dragons they're fifth in the table at the moment we've had a great start to the season four wins one draw um and Nia Jones uh one of the Welsh international players has said she's like a kid in a candy shop she's she's back she's learning and I see Jill Mack as one of the, the golden generations. You know, yeah. there was you, there was Norma Plummer. There were these coaches that we looked up to and went, wow, yes. you know, we'd love to be coached by them. Um, and she's doing a fantastic job. But I guess my my question is, how is that still happening that we, we, we perhaps, like the input Jill can have is still world class, which obviously could be, but almost where we're lacking with that in England. Like how do we bridge those gaps almost? Well, you've just got to... Um, I guess, invite those people back into your sport. So Colette Thompson, I know she's retired, but really I'd be having her on a bench somewhere because she knows how to win. I mean, she backed up Tracy in that final. And I've known Colette for a long time and we're both teachers. And I'm certain that we can use the wisdom of our past players and coaches far more than we do. Um, and, you know, Jill, I rely, I've relied on Jill so much over the years, um, particularly when I was Diamonds coach because she was our Diamonds coach when I was coaching in our Super League at the time, which was Melbourne Phoenix. And I so valued her support at that time as a young coach taking over. I just had, enough, you know, my other, my son I had three kids and she was the Australian coach. She was so supportive and I love the example she set for us as, um, you know, the domestic coaches. We, we would have meetings twice a year about, you know, how to improve what we were doing in the high performance space and what she expected us to be delivering to the athletes. I had Eloise Southby at the time and Sherelle McMahon and Liz Boniello and Bianca Chatfield. I had a number of an Australian players that I miss, you know, they went to camps and, you know, I had to figure out what I was going to do the following week because I wouldn't have them. Um, you know, they'd be having their workload monitored. But Jill was ahead of the game totally and yeah. a great role model for me because she also played in the centre court as well. So I just loved – I actually played against her in nationals as well for Victoria um, so I've always looked up to her and and the same in coaching and the fact that she just recently got an order of the Australia medal, um, no one was more pleased than me and I text her straight away and, yeah, she's she's one of our greats. Yeah, it was, it was well-deserved as well. I think it um, kind of comes back to that 
that full circle then, doesn't it? Sort of about this mentoring role yes. and the roles that almost the clubs can produce yes, to, to can. Help, help that. So so you you came over in 2021 and everyone's eyes lit up. You've joined London Pulse as performance director. And, you know, I, I guess eyes lit up from me as well from another piece because I'm like, well, why aren't you coaching? You're like one of the best coaches in the world, but actually you're coming into a PD role. And the impact you can have in those roles is is huge. And actually that's something I think the game's got to shift and we've got yeah. to see that across clubs more and get the right people into that for all the reasons we're talking about. But we talk a lot about when English players come into Australia and when English coaches come out there to learn and when Aussie coaches, you know, help us. What did you learn about the English game? Like, What were some of the key takeaways that when you came to Pools were either real eye-opening or a real eye? Oh, oh, look, wow, the, okay, the, biggest, the biggest eye-opener was the actual training environment. It is very, very difficult um, to even get a training venue is a, is a struggle, uh, particularly in London for... You know, Sam was always scratching her head. We would have to change venues quite a lot. And it's not ideal. Um, and particularly the floors, like I've always worried about the floors in England, even when I was Australian coach. I would not like training on concrete and vinyl over the top. Can I just tell all of you out there, if you're listening from other sports, netball is one of the most demanding sports in the world the accelerations and decelerations that are done um, by our players are enormous and the power developed. Mm. So you really have to be mindful of the surface that you do train on. And I know your Prem Leagues also train and play on asphalt, which is, you know, that's all you can do. Um, but that's one of the biggest things that were, you know, it was an obstacle. Um, but we worked yeah. our way around it. Um, one of the first things I did was appoint staff and with, with of course, Sam's um, cooperation, of course, and understanding. Two key people are your strength and conditioning and your physio, um, and they must work together. What I've seen in Australia is when they work not together in silos, you don't get the best athletes. So at the very base level to have a strength and conditioning coach who understands the movement patterns of netball from a functional point of view, and then the physios who understand the rigours of netball, but also the team aspects of it and support that, then you're looking like you've got a chance because you can get a lot out of your pre-season. Um, and then it was work on the skills, to be fair, Tamsin. It was just a bit of good old-fashioned Aussie repetition 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 <laughs> i remember those days at the firebirds if we didn't have a cone down on the floor it was going to be a it was an interesting session <laughs> yeah look it's um you know it's one of the things that's kept australia at the top and you know die honey mm -hmm. and i just spoke about that yesterday or the day before i forget we just was we were both bemoaning the fact that we're worried that, um, particularly in Victoria, we're not spending enough time on the basic skills because that is the foundation. At the end of the day, you've got to play a, a game that you throw the ball to each other. So it's not just fitness work, it's everything. So that's the balance and that's why it was fascinating for me to come into that role because I got a chance to really, I think, influence in a way that was very, very special. Um, and I did get to coach two games as head coach when Sam was away. So that was pretty cool. You got you got your buzz. Oh, well, well, I mean, the legacy is still there. I was I was with Sam this weekend. Um, Pulse, Pulse medaled in the NPL in two age groups. Um, yeah, I'm Sarah's really proud of them. Just, just, you know. I'm very no, they, proud they of are, them, you, as you know. Um, I, and and you you know you looked at a young group there and you brought them through and they're doing very well again this year. In the, oh, in the that was the other and, thing and I, I will think... say, Tams, in his selection. I did have a fair yeah. bit to say about selection at the club because I think what was happening was it wasn't systematic enough. And there were look the great thing is there's a lot of girls trialing, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And Pulse have such a wonderful hub system, which is like our academy system here. And so I did a lot of work also with those hubs and academies on professional development of those coaches. And I know Sam's continued that. That is crucial. If you can get the basics going in those hubs, then they come through to your NPL teams 
And that's when you're really cooking with gas. Um, and we were really trying to look for as many exciting athletic players as we possibly could in our trials. So I oversaw quite a lot of the trials. And I think I helped the coaches and the selectors to see a little bit more outside the box. So instead yeah. of looking at what you have got now, what might you have in the future? That's what another part of what's been part of the success of Australia is the fact that we can look at talent, select it, and then develop it. Well, I want to talk about that because I always I always say that, you know, Australia is like a conveyor belt of talent. Mm. It doesn't matter, you know, a key player comes to the end of the career and then, oh, oh just pops another one that just steps in. And But it's not just about their physical presence. It's about their mental presence as well. Totally. How, how important is that pathway? Like, how, almost how is that being done? Because, you know, you can do your skills, you can do your intensity, you can fix certain things, but that mental resilience is what, what, what gets me because I find over here, younger players, not all, you know, yeah. you, you get yeah. your anonymous, obviously, but lots of players take two or three seasons to break through and understand that. And yet you just seem to get this grip from Australia that once you're there, you you know you're there and you, that's where you're supposed to be. I think it is part of the numbers game too, Tams. And I think because we have such okay. a large participation base, it literally is harder to um, get out of the Australian team than, than get into it in many respects. Because once you're there, you know, you want to stay there. Um, and mm -hmm. our numbers, you know, it's it's not a fait accompli. You look at Simone McInnes and Sharon Finnan, white, um, you know, Sharon in any other age would have been the wing defence for Australia, but Simone McInnes was in the way. Um, that's, the, that's the key. You've got depth in every position. And I know England's really working hard on that, and I can see that in their programming. And I applaud them for it because that has made a difference, in my opinion, in the way England has performed on the international level, particularly their development of their Roses pathway. That, for me, is a little bit better than Australia. Okay. Yes. Well, that's intriguing. That I, is I intriguing. Like that. Mm, yes, because okay. I, see, it, it I, I got like... to see behind the curtain. Yeah. I think... What's key for me as well is how integral those roles are from a coaching point of view, yeah. because you often find that your coaches work through the age groups yeah. and up to the club and then get to international. Actually, those roles underneath mm. are just as important, if not more important at times, because I, find, I kind of find once you become an international coach, you, you're looking at tactical things, you're looking at one percenters, you're yes. looking at tweaks, you're looking at culture, yeah. you're looking at the other bits. The person that develops that player for you, that work needs to be done beforehand. And I'm not sure we do enough work at almost isolating coaches to their strengths. Yeah. It's almost like you're a good coach yeah, we, and you're supposed to do all. We've got a couple of examples. John uh, Belkin, and he's, he's passed away now, but he was a coach that I had to coach against when I was uh, coming up through the pathway coaching Victoria and he coached South Australia he specialised in the under-17 age group. So South Australia just kept oh winning it, winning it, winning it. The reason was because of the total program that he provided, he always got to know the athletes first, uh, sorry, people first, and he also was fantastic at picking talent and who wanted to play for South Australia. And so all of those things have been elements of, you know, repeatability up through the Australian teams as well. So I learnt a lot from him. Um, and I was very fortunate to have Cathy Fellows in Victoria as well as our VIS coach, Victorian Institute of Sport. We also had Margie Keldo. We had Jane Searle. We've now got Alyssa McLeod. We're very lucky that those coaches have been so good at developing our talent underneath and have brought those athletes up to, you know, the state level and also to the domestic um, Super League level. So you, you can't do it without them. Um, no. And, you know, Kathy's shown how wonderfully well she's done as assistant to Tanya in the defence end coaching the Jamaicans up there. Um, she's brilliant. Yeah.
Yeah, and I think I think it's definitely shifted in England now. They're seeing that, that we're getting more of these core coaches in these age group roles. Um, but like I say, it's sort of that being overseen at the top, almost that understanding that connection between what we're needing from the top level and what we're getting the pathway. We're certainly getting better. I want to turn attention back then to, to the pro game. It's changed so much. And I think it was starting to shift um, as you were coming to the end of your career as, as Aussie Diamonds coach, that it was always the Oz-New Zealand battle. That was always going to be it. Yes, it was a bit then, boring, you know, it, <laughs> it, Well, it was a bit. It was a bit. England started clawing in. We got a few wins. And Jamaica came on the scene. South Africa came on the scene. We've now got Uganda in the mix. Malawi we, up there as well. And that started to change. But Australia still keep on top. And I, I wonder... How how much is that down to the SSN and and sort of the variety that you have of all the international players there? We hear loads about New Zealand working together as a group of coaches under the Silver Ferns coach. We don't hear so much of that at Aussie. Is that happening? Are they the conversations happening? Where do you think that's even coming from? Yeah, it does happen. I think it reflects the um, again the geopolitical scene. We are a, a country that has states. And a bit like the United States, they have a fair bit of power. And, um, you know, the federated system provides, it provides interesting things. It provides competition. And I think you've got to get the balance right between um, colleagues and competitiveness. Because if you create uh, too much dependence on the top, uh, then you're, you're definitely going to... Um, well, you're not going to get the out-of-the-box thinking that you're getting, like Dan Ryan's produced with the Fever in their first match. Yeah. Um, you know, the excitement yeah, levels that he had when he was telling me about his new new roster. Like, everyone was focused on who'd left, but he was looking at it from the glass half full, which is what you should be doing, mm -hmm. and the excitement that that provides coaches the regeneration it provides. So Stacey uh, Marinkovic has a different philosophy to me, a little bit more. She's a bit more hands-off, which I don't mind. I think it's actually working at the moment. I mean, you know, the coaches do work very closely together, particularly the staff. The physios, the head physio for Australian netball will be in a very good place in relationship with the physios from all the clubs because it is vital in that regard. And the same in strength and conditioning. So it is a balance. Um, you know, Stacey will go and do visits like I used to do, all of that stuff. Um, and she provides lots of feedback back to the coaches, but not about how they're doing their job. I think she understands that she doesn't yeah. have to be their mentor. Um, she's really a colleague. And the coaches can have their own mentors, um, and as she does as well. So I think that's really important. You've got to keep it a system, but you've also got to have it very competitive. Otherwise, you get a bit of um, laziness, really, because you're relying on others yeah. rather than developing and innovating yourself. That's what I have observed over the past 30 years. I think... Picking up on innovating, um, Australia always had that style, didn't they? They were one-on-one -on -one defence. They hassled you. They were always fitter than everybody else. They could wind, grind you down. And then yeah. the game shifted. And it, we've seen a shift in the last few years. Everyone's shooting higher percentages. People are throwing less ball away. Possession netball. I've never seen the ball recycle so much back to the line. Like, I mean, it changed. And teams were winning less ball defensively now is, is my key thing. Because I've had debates with coaches all over the world about this, about, you know, can you win ball? Can you intercept ball? Or is it still about grinding down? And I think Australia have been the biggest one for me because unlike Jamaica, who have produced players like Shamira, who are just incredible at winning ball, that's yeah. just natural yeah. freak talent. But Australia, have, have, you know, we see him put in a little zone. We see him box defence. We, we've seen a real shift and difference. Where do you think the game goes defensively now? Because it, it, it is going to be a big part of the game, I think, keeping the competitiveness moving forward. Yeah, look, forward. it's really, and I can say with my hand on my heart, watching Peter Ma, who was a 17 and under coach for South Australia, just win a tournament, she talked about seven attackers, seven defenders. It is just absolutely vital to the game now that no matter which position you play, you have to understand and contribute 
attack and defence, even the goal shooter. Uh, as I said to Berry Neal, if she wants to get over here, she has to be able to shoot her long shots and she has to get defensive tips because that's what all the coaches are looking for. It's vital and it's so important if your attack end can turn ball over. You will remember that anyway, Tamsin, from me coaching at World, um, in the World 7, I think. I probably oh, yeah. moaned about it to you. <laughs> yes, it's probably why you didn't play me. No, not necessarily. That's <laughs> Jul- that was Julie's decision, <laughs> Tamsin. Um, but yeah. at the end of the day, yes, it was no, a big I got, part I got of time. picking play. And you knew, you knew I had the defence end to die for to coach. I mean, I had Jeeva, Sonia, yeah. Peter Scholes and, Nat, and Tash mm-hmm. Chocolate. I mean, it was just be, like being in a chocolate shop. Pardon the pun. It's a good team. But that's the thing. Everyone has to play defence or attack. You have to spend time at every session on team defence. Most coaches do not do that I know I've watched them um they spend it on their special yeah. their defense end and they have their attack in practicing it but what you actually have to develop is time on task in your sessions where the whole team is defending and you're practicing those different elements whether it's one-on-one hedging a press up the front or a press into over the entire um court Uh, Our coaches that understand press are very, very important indeed. The ones that have had basketball experience, uh, Jane Searle comes to mind there. I definitely leaned on Jane Searle a lot during uh, my Australian time just to, to, to go over those finer points of it. I would invite a basketball coach in at different times to work on that. Uh, because they just have a better sense of it. I actually was very lucky because I came from a club mm-hmm. in Victoria that played a centre court press back in the 90s and 80s. And we that was our way of trying to beat Norma Plummer's team, Melbourne Blue, who played beautiful one-on-one defence. So, and I'm always, yeah. look, my thing is foundationally one-on-one defence is it. Because when it comes down to it, like you were just describing before, if you can one-on-one against someone, that is the difference. But your team defence is vital these days. And you'll see Kira Austin and yeah. you'll see Kara Conan and Sophie Garbin and Steph and whoever else is going to come into the Australian team, they will all be defending and are expected to defend and need to do their job for the team. Yeah, and I think that's something that can definitely start to um, influence at a younger age yeah. that you're not just coming in as an attacker. Yeah, we were definitely that seeing that at nationals, yeah. particularly the teams that are coached by the men, which is interesting. They sent, t- tend to have more uh, deliberate strategies on their defensive play. So you can see all those games. I think uh, even in England, you can see them. They're on a live stream. I'm sure there'll be a library somewhere. It, it's worth watching particularly the finals, the way the coaches go about it, um, how they change up their defensive strategies. Um, I certainly spoke to both coaches about that during the week, that sometimes, you know, if you're getting penalised too much, that's what ours came down to. We were getting too many penalties up a particular end. You have to change your defensive strategy to, you know, go more Kiwi-like. And, of course, the Kiwis, they're the masters at it. So, yeah. No, absolutely, and e- and even they're having to shift. Well, their they've, game had, as well, to go, they they've had to go. They've had to go one on one. Nolene understands how suffocating yeah. that is, and they've had to get fitter. And it's yeah, there's been it's been a real it's been a really interesting yeah, part of the game for me. Well, listen, we could always talk for hours, so I'm going to get on to your digital series that you're doing at the moment, interviewing. It's the Suncorp Coaches Series, and you're chatting to to the best coaches in the world yes. basically at the moment can you tell me well, a little bit about it's that fascinating it's I I know you understand that because you love interviewing and finding out new stuff <laughs> I'm exactly the same oh, yeah. I just love it I'm just such a learner and nerd about those things so just talking and knowing them as well personally is pretty fantastic yeah so my purpose was to make a difference and to really highlight our world-class coaches. So I might do an international series next, um, Tamsin, 
and you will be one of the coaches I do interview. So you better be ready for it. But what I did is I had a generic set of questions that I wanted to ask all of them, which was an education piece. Uh, My editors thought that was a bit boring to start with, but then they realised how fascinating it was because you got so many different answers and I Mm -hmm. could take them on a journey and a story. So I'm very proud of that and the way that that was developed. And then we, of course, had to ask the, you know, the standard questions about all the players and recruitment, et cetera, and how their styles were going to be. But it's been a fascinating series. I've loved it. And the feedback I've got from people and the coaches loved it as well. That was the big thing for me. I wanted them to enjoy it. I didn't want them to think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to trip them up and make them look bad. That is not my purpose. And hopefully um, you'll see the series when you get the chance and you'll think, geez, that's really, I didn't know that about that. Or um, that's a really interesting yeah. point. You know, comparing Beck Bully, who's a second year coach, to a Julie Fitzgerald, who is so experienced. It's amazing. Yeah. I think, I think that's the thing with coaches. You often only hear from them at the end of their journey, right at the beginning when they get the role and then the end of the journey, whether it's good, bad or indifferent. But I think it's really important for them to have a voice because this shared learning and this understanding and it, it, for everything we've talked about, from the mentoring piece, from the recruitment piece, from the understanding of how it operates at sport, it, it can only be uh, a valuable thing for people to hear. So what, we will definitely be looking out for that and I'll definitely be promoting that, Lisa. That'll, that'll give me some hours of uh, listening well, and yeah, so I mean, just brilliant. the listening's fine. You don't have to watch it, um, but the listening is very interesting. So you can go for your run or your walk and have it on, mm. hopefully, a podcasty type of thing. Cool. Well, I'm intrigued. Well, listen, um, my final question, because I always like to end on something a bit light, a bit fun. If there was any team in the world right now, and it can't be the Aussie Diamonds, but any international club team, wherever. Who would you want to coach? Uh, are we talking netball? No, you can go different sport. You can go. You can go rogue. I on will me. go rogue on you. <laughs> go on. I'd love to. I'd love to have the chance to coach in the Australian Rules Football League here in my home country. I have applied for it in the past. I would love to be Alistair Clarkson's assistant at North Melbourne Football Club where I could learn about the technical side of things so that people think I can then actually coach, which I know I can anyway, but, you know, they all, they're all they all saying well, I need to do my level, I, whatever, and I did it back in university days anyway. But that would give me the opportunity to apply what I've just been speaking about. And and I think I could yeah. make a difference too there because I think their, their organisation from a board level, et cetera, um, are open to more of that out of the box thinking. Um, they've, I'm pretty sure they've got a, a, a CEO who's a woman, and also the president is a woman of the club. So to change right. the landscape here in Australia in a sport that is very, very male oriented, um, that would be wonderful for me. Uh, well, you know what, I I love that and. Sport for me is constantly evolving. Performance sport yeah. never stands still. It's always changing. It's adapting. And I think for me, it, it's the next step, right? It's how it crosses over. And, and we are starting to see that shift. And um, it takes brave people. It takes leaders. It takes brilliant people, Lisa, to make a difference in that. So um, hopefully, fingers crossed, opportunities will come about and we will keep the conversation going. But look, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. I look forward to catching up on your series and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. But please keep in touch. Will do, Tamsin. Thank you very much. Thank you.